Welcome to our next discipleship class. So last week we had started Ezekiel 38 talking about the Ezekiel 38 war and we have come to uh, Ezekiel 38 verse 7. So we're going to take a look here and why don't we just uh, start in. Um, if you watched last week you know that we just basically had brought this, these verses up on the screen and then um, you know, cut it just because of time. So jumping back in, uh, after we go through the alignment of nations that we have now done, um, God says in verse 7, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So this is referring to when Israel currently has come back for the second time uh, into their land, not just from Babylon, but from many nations around the world, and like we've said, they became a nation at least recognized by the UN in 1948 and now uh, are in the land in unbelief, Ezekiel 36 and 37, as we talked about. And now we have the Ezekiel 38 war. So Magog is spoken to as the one told to be prepared and to prepare the allied forces with them and be a guard for them. Uh, Magog is both arming and watching over the Allied forces. Iran has Russian weapons today. Uh, so uh, we know that even Russia has uh, weapons and uh, military resources in Syria and Lebanon. So uh, they obviously uh, have been prepared all around the, the Middle East. Um, uh, in particular, uh, their focus on Israel. A uh, note here, after chapter 36 of Ezekiel, about gathering many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, uh, desolate, they were brought out of the nations. So this is really referring, again, um, to just a couple of chapters earlier, what God had said he would do uh, with Israel in bringing them back. So Jews, became, Jews came from around the world to pilgrimage uh, to Israel and were recognized as a nation by the UN in 1948. As I mentioned, this also tells us <clears throat> where the battle is, the mountains of Israel, along with what's said in chapter 39, not the valley of Megiddo as Armageddon in Revelation 16. So uh, just to kind of differentiate, because some people get the two confused, this is not the Armageddon war. In chapter 37, uh, we have the Valley of Dry Bones prophecy, bringing the nation back to life, though not spiritually at this point. That will happen at the end of chapter 39, where God puts his spirit on Israel. Uh, they are a people with a national identity, but not with faith in Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. Uh, the word safety can also be understood as confidently or carelessly. Um, the same way it's used in chapter 39, verse 6. So assuming there is reason for confidence, which results in careful uh, carelessness, which is what the issue of the word is. So the question now is, when will the battle occur? So we know who the players are, we know the location and all that. So what about the when? So certainly the war has not occurred yet. We know that. Uh, the whole war scenario has not been accomplished, and it must be after 36 and 37, which 36 and 37 are, um, for the most part, accomplished. And, um, you know, this is why, um, you know, Ukraine oftentimes is thought of as being part of this. It's really not mentioned prophetically. So this is really just the setting up of the chessboard. So chapter 36 indicates Jews will be back in the land in faith. 
Uh, chapter 37 indicates Jews will be united as one nation, not a divided nation with Ephraim and Judah, as Ephraim and Judah were in the past. Um, so in the past, Ephraim and Judah, the northern and the southern tribes were uh, divided. Uh, this will go away when they are brought back in faith. Now, so though they are brought back physically, uh, the, the pouring out of God's spirit and their experiencing of the new birth has not yet occurred. They are not under the new covenant. If they were, they would be in the church. So the church will be taken out of the world. Then God will deal with Israel uh, in that way. But right now, the only aspect of chapter 36 and 37 is their physical population of the land. So these have not occurred yet. Thus, neither could chapters 38 and 39. Um, in other words, they haven't been unified into one nation in that sense. Um, they're not in faith and they're not fully unified. So some see this war after the first seal in Revelation 6, which is in the tribulation period. So the tribulation period begins with chapter 6 uh, in the book of Revelation with the first seal and then uh, goes all the way through and then uh, ends uh, really with the coming of Christ in chapter 19. But the pouring out of judgments, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls travel through from chapter 6 through to 18. Uh, because there is war that is right after that, and it is a major event, uh, almost 2 billion people will die in war, famine, the result of war, pestilence, etc. during the seal judgments. We know that certainly... Um, this war, which is really isolated to particular nations, is not referencing the war uh, in particular of the seal um, in Revelation 6. So it's not the war seal in that sense. Um, that is a, a lot larger, uh, though it can certainly have uh, a piece of it uh, worked in there. It is not the entire thing. So others see the war happening uh, so some see it as starting after the tribulation starts. Some see it starting before the tribulation, which gives occasion for the Antichrist to step in and help the Jews gain their confidence. Um, and that would mean that it was kind of uh, a gap after the rapture, because the rapture needs to occur before the Antichrist is revealed um, as such. So uh, there are different views. Now, it's clear the church must be gone uh, in reference to the tribulation period because God's going to pour out his spirit on Israel. We see in chapter 37, he talks about that, Ezekiel, and also chapter 39, 29, um, really for those who are going to be the remnant of the nation that will believe during the tribulation period. So in either view, whether it kind of starts before or after the actual start of the tribulation, which really starts with the signing of the covenant of the Antichrist for seven years. We learn that in Daniel 9.27. In either view, it's after the rapture of the church. So God does not work through both the church and Israel simultaneously. One's a nation, the other's a body. In other words, God has never worked through both. When Israel was a nation, he worked through them. Uh, then they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. The end of Matthew 23, your house is left to you desolate. You won't see me again until they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, and with that, um, you know, we have uh, certainly the uh, few week transition period and then you have the, the birth of the church. But um, the point is, is that God moves from Israel as a nation dealing and reaching the world through them to pouring his spirit out upon the church and the apostles with the evidence of the miracles validating that he's now speaking through them and no longer through Israel as a nation. So you, you can't really have both. Uh, God's not going to work through both at the same time because in the church you have um, no ethnic distinction. A Jew does not have a priority over uh, a Gentile in the church. Everybody is equal. Um, 
in Israel as a nation, when they are regathered uh, into the millennial reign, uh, the Jews actually do have a priority over the Gentile because it's a national issue. Um, Jesus will be reigning from Jerusalem, and so uh, Israel will be receiving all the promises and prophecies uh, that they had been anticipated will be now fulfilled during the millennial reign, and then the Gentile nations will be separated out to themselves, but will come up each year to worship. Uh, if they don't, then there are repercussions for that. So the, the point is, is that uh, it, it can't be both. It's one or the other. Now, we know that it's not the church in the tribulation period, because in Revelation 7, you have the Jews uh, listed the 144,000 distinct from the Gentiles after that, and they are never done like that in the church. They're not separated and differentiated in that way in the church. So the believers during that time are not the church. Some, uh, number five, some have tried to make this war Armageddon. We had talked about that, but there are far too many difficulties with that position. The nations are different. Uh, the results are different. The state of Israel is different. Uh, specific location is different. Revelation 16, the bowls leading up to Armageddon, uh, mentions major details that don't coincide with the Ezekiel 38 war. So I know a lot of people just happen to see wars, but there are distinctions between them, and they need to be maintained. Uh, there's no beast or false prophet here. Uh, all the kings um, are gathered to battle. In Revelation 16, the Euphrates is dried up, the sun is burning people, there's no plagues, no sun, no moon darkened, uh, that Jesus said would happen at his return at the end of the tribulation. So none of these things are occurring. Um, you know, obviously one of the biggest differences, the, the beast, and, and again, we don't want to argue from silence, uh, just because the beast isn't mentioned, the Euphrates, the sun, the plagues, the sun, the moon, all that, though those are quite a few, um, the nations are different. They're not, you know, it's not the, the demonic gathering all the nations for war, it's only selected nations. So uh, others make it the Revelation 20 war at the end of the thousand year reign because Gog and Magog are mentioned and they just kind of connect the terminology. Again, the only similarity is Gog and Magog. Other than that, all is different. Uh, it's the same land that will be there during the thousand year reign. Gog will be there because he is either a new leader or a demonic being uh, still in existence either way, but um, that's the only thing that is the same. Everything else, the situation and everything is different. So moving on to verse 9 and 10, you will ascend. He's talking to uh, essentially um, this cloud of people from the north, um, these, these nations coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord, on that day it shall come to pass that evil thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. So Satan always puts evil thoughts into the minds of people, especially governmental leaders. Uh, in Proverbs 6, there are seven things God hates. Verse 18 says, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. That's just what we have here. Only Satan is behind the thoughts and evil plan like Peter when Jesus had to rebuke him in Matthew 16, right? <clears throat> you know, uh, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He made that confession of uh, who Jesus was. Jesus said that that was a revelation. Then uh, Jesus said, I'm going to have to, you know, the Messiah is going to have to go down to Jerusalem, be, be betrayed at the hands of sinful men and, and killed, and then raised on the third day. And Peter said, far be that from you, Lord. So Peter starts actually rebuking Jesus, telling him to save himself and don't let that happen. And then um, obviously that was not of God uh, because Jesus' purpose in coming was by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, as Peter told us in Acts 2. So this is from the devil. That's why Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man, which are influenced by the devil, who's the God of this world. Now, I'll see, let's see, God is the first cause of this action. 
where it says the hooks in the jaw, verse 4, uh, that indicates this. But the secondary cause is Satan. So what's the wicked plan? Now, God uh, puts the um, kind of the pieces together there. And then, uh, you know, Satan devises the plan. So what is the wicked plan? Um, verse 11, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Uh, many years ago, cities had walls, bars, and gates. It was their only defense against raid and attacks. Now, obviously, um, though that could be helpful today, I mean, when you're lobbing rockets over from another uh, state into Israel, um, you know, walls don't help much. Uh, it must have been strange for Ezekiel to see a city not surrounded by walls for safety in his vision, which again, we have today. We don't have cities with walls around them. Uh, this may be related to the false peace Paul mentions in First Thessalonians 3, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. This will begin or be at the beginning of the tribulation period, the day of the Lord, which is prophetically spoken of as a time of labor pains upon a pregnant woman. First Thessalonians 5.2 says, For you know yourselves, uh, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. In other words, it's unexpected. So there's no way to actually know when the tribulation starts other than really we know at the beginning the Antichrist will sign uh, that treaty, but we, but we don't know when that day is going to happen. Uh, nobody does, uh, even though uh, as Christians, and Paul gets into this in 1 Thessalonians 5, we can be ready for the rapture, uh, and that day is going to happen anyways uh, with the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation. However, um, th it's going to come upon the world in a very unexpected way. We expect it, though we don't know the day or the hour. We expect it to happen. We know it's going to happen, but we're not going to be surprised by it, actually. I don't believe we'll be even be here for it to be surprised. So next, why will the battle occur? Well, the evil thought is to take advantage of an opportunity to enrich themselves, these armies, right? Um, the Islamic nations have wanted to eradicate Israel from the land since they became a nation in 48, which also may be why other allied nations will join Magog in this battle. Uh, Saddam Hussein, who's gone now, uh, said he'd drive them into the ocean, Israel. Uh, uh, Muhammad uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, he said he would wipe them off the map, Israel. Uh, he's gone now. So um, these guys come and go. Uh, the nation of Israel is going to remain. Jeremiah 31 tells us that uh, you'd have to get rid of the sun, moon, and stars before God's going to get rid of Israel. So we know that's not going to happen. So both are gone from the world seen now. The word of God abides forever. Israel is still in their land, and these guys are gone. Now, if Israel could be kept from their land or taken out of it, not only would the word of God fail, but the Messiah couldn't return, fulfilling the prophecy of coming to Jerusalem to reign over the Jewish people, restoring the kingdom to Israel. That's the spiritual attempt by Satan to remain in control of the world, using nations as puppets. That is his goal. But that's not going to happen. I mean, the end is already written, so it doesn't really matter anyways. But even prophetically, like I said in Jeremiah 31. So what do the nations themselves see as the reason that they are going in? Uh, follow the money, like in most uh, criminal enterprises um, or <clears throat> things that, especially from a governmental perspective, you always follow the money. So Paul said the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And isn't that true? So verse 12 says they are going to take, this is the reason, to take a plunder uh, and to take booty to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited. And again, a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. So these are the resources in Israel uh, as we've learned, even the past number of years with their gas reserves and the Mediterranean Sea that's huge. Russia wants in on them. Um, they, have, they have tried to negotiate for them and everything else, especially when 
Benjamin Netanyahu is the prime minister. Um, you know, uh, Putin met with him trying to get access to that those uh, natural gas resources and everything. And Israel has oil also. Uh, so uh, that's not even to mention the mineral deposits in the Dead Sea. I mean, there's a wealth of uh, resources there in that little land that people want, nations. Uh, not to mention Israel's oil resource reserves and wealth in the Dead Sea. Let's see, energy is a major issue for the world, and Russia needs the resources to fuel their economy and government. I mean, we see that even right now uh, with this war in Ukraine, how um, there's all kinds of problems because um, so much of Europe's energy is supplied by Russia. Uh, the U.S. is in this political battle with gas and oil from being imported from Russia. So they're f all trying to figure out how uh, they're going to work with that. And the current administration, um, uh, quite frankly, shouldn't even be in that position if they had kept the original policies of the Trump administration, then we would have been uh, energy independent. And it was the first time in the history of our nation that we were energy independent and actually a net exporter of energy um, and to, you know, to get rid of that, can't even get into that discussion. So note the energy focus within the nations, though. So now uh, Europe is dependent on Russia for gas and oil, and they don't want to be. It's a complicated political situation. Our current state of affairs focuses on the issue with the Ukraine war. Uh, this is uh, a quote, uh, Russia can supply gas to Europe in three ways, through the Ukrainian gas transmission system, as well as through the Nord Stream and uh, uh, Yamal Europe gas pipelines. In the event that Ukraine finally ceases cooperation in the Russian Federation, gas supplies to Europe will be carried out exclusively by Russian gas pipelines. So uh, this becomes an issue. You, you see everything is surrounding resources. Uh, Ukraine, uh, their sales volume is 14.5 billion cubic meters um, of energy. So the neighboring countries to which Russia supplies gas include, uh, the other one should have popped up first, and then there's, um, I'll just list them out here instead of just read them to you. You can see them. Um, they have a tremendous amount of uh, energy resources that they receive um, from uh, Russian gas supplies. So, um, it, you know, you can see here just what, what is served by Russia. So they are a key player and they control quite a bit. Um, so verse 13 says, uh, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take a plunder? In other words, resources. Um, have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock, goods, and to take a plunder? Is that why you went there? You know, that's just the question that is asked. So finally, Sheba and Dedan, which is Saudi Arabia and or Yemen included, they ask the question. The merchants of Tarshish uh, is either Spain or parts of Europe, and the young lions, nobody really knows who that is. Some think it may be the offspring of Europe uh, from Spain or the United States or Canada, um, just being kind of the results of European settlements. So it's possible. Uh, nobody really knows. So if somebody wants to tell you that the United States is in prophecy or here or there, um, they're selling you a bill of goods because prophecy really surrounds Israel, has really nothing to do with the United States. If we are not listed, it's because we are not a player at that time. Um, and perhaps what we're watching now is the reason uh, that we won't be. So um, the the interesting thing is, is that they are not involved. In other words, we and these nations that are listed here are really not involved. They're just kind of asking the, the, the question, uh, you know, politically. So 
nor is Syria, Egypt, or Iraq mentioned as part of the warring alliance, which is very interesting. Um, Iraq is not an alliance nation and recent, recently targeted by Iran, which is interesting. Um, what about Syria? Uh, Damascus is spoken of by Isaiah as being destroyed. That has not yet happened. If Syria pulls out weapons of mass destruction, Israel will take Damascus off the map. So, we, you know, you get to realize that um, there are a lot of military resources by Russia that are built up um, in Syria. So um, this is, you know, all of this stuff is um, being connected together and planned for ultimately this Ezekiel 38 war. Isaiah said in 17.1, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Well, that hasn't really happened yet, so we know it will. But if there's that kind of a threat um, just to their northern border, I mean, Israel will level that place. They would have to for their own survival. Egypt has had good relations with Israel, uh, as had the Saudis uh, behind the scenes, not out front. So uh, and it's an interesting scenario to watch because uh, Egypt is really uh, has a lot of, um, you know, uh, Muslim uh, governmental um, influence and all that. So uh, there is an aspect of Egypt that that wants to support Israel. So it's uh, it's definitely. Um, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, you can, you can sit back and kind of watch what plays out, understanding eventually where this is going. How about the church, though? You know, what about us that are living now? Um, the question is, you know, wh what can we learn from all this? Because obviously we're not going to be there. Uh, I don't expect to see the Ezekiel 38 war, but I do expect to see the players in place for the war to start. So... Uh, and we're watching that. I mean, like I said, we, we know why these nations are aligned together. There's the, there's the Muslim connection. There's also the, the policies and the politics of these nations because of their uh, Muslim connection together along with uh, resources. The, you know, these are nations looking for these natural resources. That being said, the players are in place, stage set. Uh, more so now with the Ukraine war situation, uh, obviously because, you know, we know Russia is ready to step forward uh, because there's nothing to deter them. Um, you, you don't have President Trump and a strong leadership right now in our own government, so uh, it's easy for any nation, really, where typically the United States is kind of like the, um, the international uh, safe keeper of, you know, nations and the seas. So we were always powerful enough and had the uh, leadership in the government to prevent a lot of the dangerous nations from uh, advancing in ways that they would have liked to. Uh, I know they did not do that under President Trump. Uh, they uh, realized that whatever he said he was going to do, he would do, uh, even though he's the only president did not get us into war. Um, I know that uh, the other nations obviously realize that um, here's a guy that at least, uh, regard, and this isn't a political talk, but regardless of whether you like or don't like President Trump, um, he did what he said he was going to do, which is something that I don't know any politician that's ever done that, but everything he said he would do, he got into office and did, but it's because he's a businessman. He understands how to get things done. He's not a politician, which is why a lot of people don't like him, I would imagine, because they expect him to talk like a politician and speak like a politician instead of uh, somebody that just needs to get in there and get the job done. But we need to be living in the continued expectation of the Lord's coming to take the church at the rapture. That is our job. Now, look, we can watch Israel. We do. It's exciting in the sense that we see uh, prophecy, um, you know, if not being fulfilled at points, um, you know, the stage being set for it. So uh, all that is very exciting. But, um, you know, we need to 
make sure that we're still growing spiritually, personally, and in our churches, and then the gospel is still going out uh, from our churches and individually as we um, as we are walking with the Lord and influencing those around us. Paul said in First Thessalonians four. 13 to the end of the chapter that we're to be comforted with the rapture of the church. In other words, he told us that uh, not to anticipate the Antichrist and the church being under terrible persecution and, um, you know, having everybody um, killed because they won't worship the beast. Uh, No, we're supposed to be comforted because it's not uh, a time that we will be involved in. We find that out from First Thessalonians 5, 9. It's not our appointment to be there. So um, now the church is persecuted for the last 2,000 years in various places of the world. They still are today. Uh, so the church cannot avoid persecution, but it will avoid the judgment of God in the tribulation period. So the global situation continues to get worse every year. We know that. Paul knew the time, the end time scenario would be bad. So he said in Titus 2.13 that we need to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's our outlook. Certainly the Ezekiel 38 war, the tribulation, the Antichrist, the beheading of believers isn't what I'm looking for. Not me. I I am looking for the rapture. Uh, It's a blessed hope because Paul said, God didn't appoint us to wrath, This is the, but to obtain salvation, to obtain deliverance through Jesus Christ, right? Um, you know, earlier in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, he said that the, the Lord who has delivered us from the wrath to come. So we're not going to be in that. We'll not be here because it's not our appointment to be here. Paul said, we're, we're to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And that's not speaking of the judgment of God after death uh, in the next world. That's the wrath of God poured out upon this world during the tribulation. If the signs of Ezekiel are clear, the rapture is at the door. I think we need to be ready. So uh, that is the encouragement that I have for you. The Ukraine war is only setting up the chessboard for the Ezekiel 38 war. But Ukraine will not be part of the Ezekiel 38 war. The rapture has no signs that precede it. The Ezekiel 38 war is not a sign for the rapture. It is something that is going to occur in relation to Israel, which will enable Israel to see that God has defeated their enemies. This, I believe, now, regardless of whether it starts at the beginning of the tribulation, you know, just before it, at the beginning, or in the tribulation a little bit, um, you know, it's a war campaign. It's not like one day. So there's a war campaign going on here. Uh, some scholars think it's going to extend into the tribulation period, um, you know, begin at the beginning of the tribulation and then go for some ways into it. Uh, I'm more along the lines of thinking that it is going to be at the beginning of the tribulation period and um, kind of just one of the major events of the wars that start out at the beginning and where God will defeat Israel's enemies, then this also gives rise for the Antichrist to have an opportunity to step into that gap. So anyways, uh, that is it. And uh, hopefully that was instructive for Ezekiel 38. So until next time, um, Keep looking up for the rapture and waiting for the Lord to come for the church. And may God bless you as you continue to study his word.